Hello, um, good afternoon. Today we are uh, talking about uh, glass and trying to uh, a little bit complete our question about uh, ceramic. Because glass, as you easily know, it's a uh, transparent material well, tendentially transparent one, which is able to be produced into layers, into big um, sheets uh, of saying flat, um, basically flat material. Um, to, um, to do this, which is not usually not uh, possible with the crystals, uh, what has been traditionally used uh, to allow these uh, sort of uh, uh, ceramic material, because you start from silica, you know that the raw material for glass, for glass is silica, therefore silicon dioxide. Um, what has been traditionally done in order to uh, provide that possibility of not only transparency, because silic silica is silicon as a whole is more or less transparent, but the question is um, creating uh, large structures like windows. Uh, what has been done is to hinder, to impede the uh, crystallization. In practical terms, this means that uh, when the material is still in the fuse state, it is a little bit molten, but of course not with the fluidity you can find in uh, metals, but it is in a quasi-molten state, I would say. Uh, what you do, you allow to um, cool down but rapidly. If you cool down it rapidly, that means that the crystals are not able to form because crystallization means that you have an initiation uh, product, production of crystal, uh, and then a growth, the growth of crystal around that center, uh, that, that say incubation of crystals, and then they grow into grains, basically, as it is the case for metals, by the way. And uh, um, if you uh, impede that because we are cooling is too fast, you would have an amorphous uh, structure, which uh, is going to be less brittle than uh, most crystals and would break in another way although it would have still problems in toughness since uh, um, glass are very sensitive to the growth of cracks. If there is a crack, then you have, uh, you are likely to have fracture if the material is not sufficiently tough, as it is the case for glass. This is a big problem, as we were discussing uh, last time about uh, Griffith theory. Um, and uh, um, in, in general terms, uh, uh, the formation of glass is not confined to uh, silica. You don't have, you don't need to have uh, silica as the, the main component in order to have glass. In fact, you have also some plastics which form glass structures which form sheets which are glass-like, also sort of transparent. Uh, in these days we are talking a lot about uh, for plexiglass, so uh, polymethyl metacrylate, which is a polymer with some additives and, and it creates uh, plastics, and uh, um, it is a glassy polymer. Um, polymers the difference is that polymers are usually never crystalline. They tend to be amorphous. 
they might be crystalline, but also at very, very small dimensions and na nano dimensions. We will see that, that when we are going to talk about uh, polymers. So in practical terms, you have a um, point at which uh, glass transition occurs at a certain point in a certain range of uh, temperatures, glass forms. And this has also another consequence, that there is a limit of cooling rate under which, if it is too slow, you tend to form crystals, which might happen also during the life of the glass itself, because glass during its life tends to crystallize and break. As a, the consequence, it would break because it would not be able to um, withstand the, the relative deformations in between the grains and so on. Um, this might happen during uh, uh, its life, but this might happen also in, in production. So you have to be careful about the uh, cooling rate. So it needs to cool at a certain uh, rate, at a certain velocity. Uh, say in uh, grams per seconds, in a sorry, sorry, in, in degrees per second. In, uh, Celsius degrees per second. Okay, um, or per minute, whatever whatever you, you measure in it. But uh, um, it, an important question is that uh, you have a temperature at which uh, glass forms, which is uh, the glass transition temperature, which is of course below the melting temperature. It's, it's always below the melting temperature. In some cases, it might be substantially below the melting temperature. Of course, it depends on the additives, additives you, um, you put in a glass uh, beyond uh, silica. So with the bulk, it's usually silica. And then you have a number of additives. In general terms, they are oxides. In many cases, they are oxides um, of other metals uh, and, and so on. You have the gas transition temperature, and you have also uh, this. This is also important because you will find also this in uh, polymers. In polymers, you have again a glass transition temperature, and above the glass transition temperature, the polymer is rubber. Below the glass transition temperature, the, the polymer is glass. Difference, main difference, the main observable difference between a glass polymer and a rubber polymer is that you can pull and extend quite a lot a rubber polymer. Uh, on the other side, you cannot make a sheet, a flat sheet, a large flat sheet uh, with a um, rubber polymer, which you can instead do with a glassy polymer, but on the other side, the glassy polymer doesn't withstand a large deformation. Plexiglass wouldn't withstand a large deformation. If you have polyethylene, which is usually used as a rubbery polymer, it can withstand very large deformation. You can, you can have also some uh, bars, for example, which can uh, withstand even 200 or 300 percent. So, um, what was the start of the history of glass? There are, as, as it was the case with metals, we have also in um, glass a large interest of the archaeology. Of course, uh, an obvious development of um, glass, uh, how, how glass was uh, created, how the idea of glass came out. Uh, to uh, humans. Um, as you may remember, uh, when extracting uh, uh, metals from minerals um, by smelting, uh, basically, by um, heating the rock until it breaks and uh, the metal, metal starts flow, flowing, they always found some 
silica, which was uh, transparent. So uh, they were, um, and, and as a matter of fact, raw iron, iron which was produced until 19th century and is still rarely produced now, contains quite a considerable amount of uh, silica, which is sort of transparent. So we can easily say that this was the start of the, the story. They realized that uh silica was uh, transparent and they way, were trying to uh, make silica um, manageable in, or, in order to be uh, produced and to be cast in molds at quite um, reasonable temperature to do that to do that it was good to add some oxides of metals which weren't melting at very high temperature and which were giving also some hardness to silica. This was the case with sodium oxide and calcium oxide, but a lot of impurities were present. Archaeological studies concentrated a lot about impurities. For example, there is this study with the different uh, samples where they studied the, the impurities of iron oxide, uh, of titanium oxide, of antimonium and uh, copper oxide. Uh, because it was uh, interesting also to understand what, um, where the materials were coming from, which kind of rocks the uh, Silica were in, in practical terms uh, extracted and uh, towards the production of, uh, of glass. Um, at that time, there wasn't a, a real addition of uh, um, other components. The first addition which were started was where uh, sodium oxide and calcium oxide late, later, later on, in, uh, already in the Middle Age or so and uh, uh, lead. Lead was an important addition to, to glass uh, from the 17th, 18th century because it allowed, it was a low temperature melting oxide and it allowed the release of silicates. Because the, the big problem with glass is that it was quite strong and reasonably tough, but in very large thickness, which um, had the consequence that it was very, um, thick and, and heavy. Being thick, it was very, very heavy. Consider that uh, the density of a normal glass is not that low, it's around 3, 2.5 to 3. If it is very pure, it, it can be 2.5, as it is the case for glass fiber, which we are going to discuss a little bit. But um, a number of modifications were applied uh, during this on So um, the big question with, with glass was, was that, um, as always, as you may remember, uh, we always load and measure the mechanical properties of the material with the force we suppose we are going to apply on it. So in glass, it's often compression. If we want to have an idea of the tensile uh, strength of glass, we need to start from bending that to get the tensile um, component. Because uh, you may remember that uh, in, bending, in bending test, you have that the material is uh, tended uh, below and it is compressed at the top. Uh, so, so the bottom is uh, tended and the uh, top is compressed. So, okay, uh, of course, there were improvements. There were improvements to make uh, sheets of glass panels, glass panels, very large panels, uh, and uh, uh, these uh, started 
and, and at the beginning of the industrial era, so basically at the same time they started producing uh, structural steel. And it, this was the Pilkington process, uh, which uh, uh, basically uh, was conceived by allowing glass um, to flow over molten tin and uh, and therefore having the right uh, temperature to have slow cooling with not much stresses going around because of course initially there was uh, an open air uh, cooling down which created a lot of tensions in, in the glass panel and then uh, the the um, differences in thickness, also the variation in thickness uh, across the panel, which uh, resulted in a variation of, uh, of uh, strength and uh, of stiffness. So um, about um, compression, compression uh, tests, um, these, uh, well, you can see very uh, easily that we have these uh, the measurement of compression modulus uh, with uh, these, which is called bulk modulus, because bulk, we don't assume that glass has no porosity. This is a, a, a simple assumption, it's not very fair, but it works in uh, structural terms. When we say bulk, in material science, uh, that means that they are measuring something without considering the porosity. As if it's an homogeneous material, assuming that it is homogeneous, therefore it has a constant density and no porosity inside. Um, then that, that means uh, as well that uh, that means as well that uh, the measurement can be quite uh, variable uh, as well because in reality porosity exists and so yeah, as you can see there is a quite large variability also because we try to avoid the we, we, we try to avoid the effect of buckling of the composite into compression we, we, we would like that the, uh, the cylinders are compressed along their um, height. So basically, perpendicular uh, to their height in a, in a uh, plain way, if you want, which is not normally the case because there are porosity because there is some kind of backing going around as a consequence uh, of the uh, density. However, uh, cylinders are done quite And uh, show, and uh, in order so the the ratio between the height and the diameter is very so you can see it's um, a good ratio is around uh, one point five to the height and the diameter to get these measurements. Um, because you need some height, because you need some strain to measure some strain. Of course, if the height is less than 15 or 20 millimeters, then we are in trouble with the difficult measure of strain, even with strain gauges, of the, so which are, which are based uh, essentially on the variation of the flexes and resistance to the variation of the um, in a section of the uh, section of the method. But Apart from this practical consideration, uh, you can see here that we make some assumption. So the first one was that there is no porosity, I've already said it. It's the same assumption that you do into bulk density when you take a pile of uh, something and you say the density is uh, this because, uh, because we measure the, the weight, we weigh it, and then we measure the volume. The approximate volume, assume there is no porosity between the density. 
So this is bulk and, and also um, this is very rough as a measurement, but very simple. And also uh, we say true stress and true strain because we assume once again that it's not an engineering stress and engineering strain. We can assume that um, there is no um, the necking, there is no necking, which is reasonably true. In a glass, uh, true stress and engineering stress, it's about the same. So we can neglect, um, neglect necking, and it's about right. The values we find is, uh, are around 50 gigapascal for for um, for glass and the ISO. They are almost by ISO. As a, as a deviation. in that sense, they are not far from the not far from the ideal material uh, as for isotropy. They are elastic. The least uh, the least um, aspect close to uh, ideality is uh, homogeneity. Homogeneity because they in reality they are lower. Although we we try to avoid that in the clinical process. We have still some very small uh, air bubbles. So this is, in a sense, this brings uh, us a little bit away from homogeneity. So um, we have the soda lime and borosilicate uh, glass. Borosilicate is, is a special uh, glass which is used again, especially in uh, for resistance to high temperature, especially in, it's used quite a lot in the kitchen. It's a kind of vapor ceramic uh, material. And uh, in fact, it is disposed of in different places with respect. It's disposed of literally in differentiated ways. And instead, the soda line is disposed of in normal ways, uh, in uh, glass, in normal glass ways. Um, other uh, glass waste, for example, waste from broken mirrors. In the case of break your mirror, uh, you have this silver layer below the glass panel, which uh, again uh, impedes you to dispose of this glass into general glass waste. Okay, and uh, glass is. Transparent but might be color, might, might be color. And apart from some oxides which don't have any significant coloring, like calcium oxide and sodium oxide, and also uh, borosilicate and uh, phosphoric anhydride, basically uh, keep the transparency, although they give you some uh, larger um, uh, temperature. Temperature in the case of borosilicate, a larger temperature or higher temperature of melting, and therefore it starts flowing because creep occurs also in glass at a very high temperature, temperature closer to uh, melting temperature. So it has no, usually no uh, consequences for the main applications of, uh, of uh, glass, for example, in construction. It has some consequences where when you, you apply um, glass, for example, in, uh, oven, in the oven, where volatile silicate is preferred because uh, even at 200 degrees or so, it shows that it will be no of any flowing and of any creep. Um, so you have coloring, uh, here are some examples. Uh, the main um, actor into that are usually iron oxide because they were the most available ones. So uh, we find even uh, very, um, very uh, ancient glass which was colored in blue, uh, green or in yellow, sort of yellow like ochre. Or, uh, or even in, in uh, red, there is also some glass which colors in red. Although in some cases it's obtained in uh, hematite, usually uh, 
colors in red. Although um, it was often, now it's often uh, obtained in copper oxide because it gives a, a, a more uniform uh, red. Of course, as always in the case of colors, uh, there is a need of uh, uh, um, to uh, fine tune the amount of oxide and also to try to mix in a proper way during the, uh, the process during the casting the thing, casting in or the casting in or the creating the um, jar of the bottle. So in order to keep the color as uniform as possible. Then you have other other uh, uh, oxides which have other functions like the formation of bubbles, which is a big problem. So it's a problem because if you consider that uh, you start with glass, you start from uh, pouring it into a into a um, mold. We are going to look at some more details later on, but you, you, you pour it down a mold, and the mold is tendentially uh, room temperature, and and you go very slowly as well to keep it to keep it um, um, glassy and not crystal crystalline. In practical terms, what, what happens is that you, you need to try to avoid the formation of bubbles during this process of the low cool. In this antimonium, for example, um, would uh, allow you a so called semi metal antimonium, semi oxide. Although, well, antimonium is going to be very, it's now being very expensive because it's one of the most exhausted uh, elements in the Mendeley table, so uh, it's not cheap. Depends what you are trying to do if you want to avoid a cold uh, bubble. I think uh, it is not usually the case for bottles of jar. Um, so uh, what happens is this, in practical terms, you have the flowed glass production, which is the Pilkington process. Now, some from Pilkington sign, some more um, some more parts of the process have been introduced, and uh, in practical terms, uh, you, you get uh, the raw material, which is silica, as you may know, right, get melting. So you um, apply a high temperature, you put in the furnace, you for the applied high temperature to melt. And then you refine because there are other components which um, allow it flow it better. Uh, you uh, try to separate some unwanted com composite, uh, components which are not, of course, um, have not been separated in the first place from uh, silica. And then you let it stands for some time, and uh, uh, there comes tin, which, uh, of course, as a starts the cooling down action, starts the cooling down action, because tin it's molten, but it is at much lower temperature. Tin might be at 600 degrees easily, and it tends to um, it allows it. Uh, flowing and gradually starting very slowly to uh, become solid. It is a little bit cooled at that time, especially up when you cool, cool down from 600 to 60 degrees to avoid creating that many tension inside. Then you have uh, um, the cool down, which is baggy slow and until uh, temperatures were able to touch is almost is almost is almost my hand so 60 degrees when there is this action of uh, quality control by laser you see there are particularly bubbles or, or flows etc and uh, um, you 
then you then you cut it and uh, well you have the panels that you're able to stack as well. So you have done your glass panel. Uh, your glass panel has got if you look at in fact, section, if you ever look at, at glass panel in section, it is not transparent in section. It is so called transparent in in uh, into looking uh, at it uh, from the front or from the back, but in section it is not. It is around uh, bluish, greenish, and uh, this is the effect of the presence of the other oxides like uh, calcium and uh, calcium and uh, um, sodium, which usually don't affect that much the transparency uh, on the front and the back, but a little bit on the section. Uh, which results in, a, in terms of wavelength, it results in, a, in, a, in a not completely effective energy transmission at a different wavelength. When you talk about uh, uh, solar panels, uh, this takes a difference, and in fact, we need to have a clear white glass because, in practical terms, you absorb or energy, you are able to absorb and transmit more energy um, from the one that you get from the, from the solar energy, from the sun, and uh, then transform to electrical energy or whatever, um, or thermal energy. Um, so to, to try to make it um, even more transparent, you add again some uh, iron side in uh, um, different amount to reduce the, uh, the iron oxide, the presence of iron oxide. Iron is always mixed with uh, silica when you start with. Uh, you may remember the question with uh, rot iron, we were saying we had no pure iron because there was some percent of silica. If you reverse the problem, if you want to have a pure silica, you still have some iron oxide, which is fine if you, which is fine if you want to, um, to have some uh, um, coloration. Um, calcium and uh, um, Calcium and sodium oxide contribute to the color, but limitedly only in infection. But um, uh, iron oxide may contribute much more, even making not completely transparent at some length. So it is important that we reduce the amount of uh, oxide we can do. Uh, again, um, well, it is not. Uh, that easy, but uh, there are special magnetic uh, field cooling um, system. All, all from the raw material, you can reduce it to uh, the so silica. The so silica is not magnetic. You can try to, uh, to separate the part of the powder which is more rich to which is higher, so it is more magnetic. Uh, the problem, you see why it happens, because in reality, the mm, smelting temperature of silica and of the uh, end of the iron oxide are quite similar. So in reality, they respond to the problem and so on. You can heat treat as well uh, glass. You can have an annealing, which means that you have a, uh, once you have um, produced it, you, uh, you can have a, a particularly slow cooling, a particularly slow cooling to relieve the, the internal stresses. Uh, or you can, in tampering, you raise it, it, reproduce it, and you repeat it. Then you cool it again uh, slowly, not to allow it becoming a crystal, and you can have 
an external part which cools before then the internal part. The consequence is that the external parts are compressed and the uh, internal parts are tense. Um, so you have this kind of uh, uh, differences into um, this kind of differences into uh, the force which is applied, the stress which are applied, and this uh, accustomates. In, the pra in practice, the material to the fact of being subjected to a hot treatment for cold, cold cycles, uh, which might be the case of a window panel, even worse in some cases, like uh, smaller windows, um, to allow it accommodate deformation, allow it accommodate deformation, not stress under hot cold cycles. Um, just because of, of the formation of flows, because of the um, variation of uh, stresses. Uh, it is a kind of training of uh, glass to, uh, to accommodate this variation of stress in the surface. Uh, so um, you can have. Uh, also other types of processes because for example you can you can also allow after that uh, tampering you, you can have a fast cooling relatively fast cooling not to become a crystal but to become it harder and tougher especially uh, or you can have a slow cooling which increases the strength not necessarily the hardness and the toughness um, and you increase the strength also because you might like um, reducing the, the, um, the thickness of the uh, glass panels whenever um, possible um, it is also important to consider that uh, as per uh, Griffith's theory, which you may remember, the question of uh, um, glass fracture, glass uh, fracture is usually due to the propagation of the path and unstable, therefore, propagation of a crack. Then you have the K1C, the K1C, uh, which is uh, the um, stress intensity factor uh, for which uh, uh, sufficient energy is developed for the crack to become unstable. Of course, this, this can be done, this has been done also on panels, considering the compressive zone and the tensile zone, for example, this kind of study, where you see also the uh, one important thing, that always the numbers are not that important, it is important the concept that you have a considerable dependence. Since the thickness in glass is not negligible, with respect to most cases, in, uh, the effect of uh, thickness is not negligible. And still, in most cases, the effect of thickness is not that uh, important because uh, um, uh, steel and sheet are not that and laminates and so on are not that um, big. Also because, and in particular, but in particular for the other reason that it is a conductor. So in practice, the, the stresses, variation in internal variation in temperature is uh, important uh, in glass, uh, which is not in steel because it tends to uh, uh, cool down all at the same all at the same time because of the conductivity, the thermal conductivity. This doesn't happen in glass, so the effect of the presence of the glass of the position of the crack with, with respect to thickness um, makes a lot of a difference. Then you have um, of course there is a, a dependence also from the 
this considers a portion of the thickness, and you can see the crack position and uh, then the stress intensity factor. The stress intensity factor can uh, go up or down depending on the plate, uh, on the position with respect to the plate surface, on the crack with respect to the plate surface, and also in depending on the ratio between the crack size and the, and the plate surface. Of course, as always, we haven't considered yet the fact that the crack might have different shapes, which is a further refinement of this kind of model. But it is useful anyway to show trends about the, um, the relation between the K1C and the ratio between crack size and plate surface and the position of the, um, the crack with respect to the thickness uh, of the plate. So um, this is not the only possibility to do uh, to produce uh, uh, glass, as I was saying, the filtering point process. Um, so float glass. You can uh, have also uh, more and more now glass laminates. Glass laminates means that we have two panels. Since we have observed that thickness in glass is the problem, because uh, crack might propagate, which we uh, might not exactly control, and also in terms of fabrication, you may see that uh, there are limits of what you can do because you have all these differences between. Uh, in cooling between one part and the other part of the uh, across the thickness of the, the glass panel, exalted by the fact that you have to go slowly in cooling it down with, to keep it glass. So in the end, you have a, a lot of tension going around, which are solved uh, by tempering or heat printing. But in some cases, you would prefer, there are different, you would prefer referring to glass laminates. Um, of course, there are different uh, approaches, different uh, school of uh, thought, I would say, to philosophy, different philosophy. Uh, for example, in car windows, uh, there are some which still prefer tempered glass with no lam laminate uh, because laminate reduces a little bit transparency but it is safer because basically you have two laminates two uh, glass panels which are bonded by a polymer or by a sticky polymer therefore a rubbery even more than a sticky one we will talk more into details in, uh, when talking about uh, polymers, but basically they start with PVC with polyvinyl chloride in the, the first experiments were done in the 30s, where uh, when, when uh, polyvinyl chloride came on, then uh, polyvinyl butyrate demonstrate more of, of butyrate than what uh, the physicists like use anyway, PVB. Um, became more um, available and uh, demonstrated a, a higher bonding capability. Um, this has a, a number of consequences. Introducing a polymer, basically, you are introducing a polymer in the glass. So, this has a, one consequence that you um, allow for water. For moisture, have an effect on your glass, say on your glass window. So, this is the curve on your left, which, uh, which is a study about uh, the uh, equilibrium moisture, so the amount of uh, moisture or water vapor which is absorbed in polyvinyl multi rate. Um, and um, with respect to the relative humidity, the humidity in the air. Um, 
which means, uh, um, which might mean uh, also some uh, deformation of the film and uh, especially its night effect, as you may know, we see the bonding ability. Plus, you have another problem that you have a polymer which has not any particularly high um, melting temperature. So in practical terms, that means that uh, you are able to use your window, um, your uh, car, car screen or whatever, at the uh, room temperature and it works quite well. Mm, consider that the uh, glass is hardly ever above 20 degrees. So uh, even the worst situations, uh, very unlikely it exceeds 25 degrees. 25 degrees on glass is already uh, quite a lot. Um, as a matter of fact, what happens is that the models, the shear models, because when you have a film, you measure your models in shear, because uh, what you are interested in is shear resistance. So basically adhesion. And it goes uh, down very quickly above 20 degrees, which might be worrying as well. Uh, so you need to manage in order also the relevant thicknesses in order to, uh, to avoid as much as possible that the temperature of glass goes up. You manage the different thicknesses because you manage the different the ratio between the uh, thickness of the glass panels and the thickness of the bonding material. Mm -hmm. um, to try to um, control thermal conductivity and therefore damage. So, um, if you want to produce a, a coming back to a bottle, to a simple uh, production, this is a course about material science. So I, I don't talk much about material technology, which basically is another matter how you produce materials. Uh, I try to give you some ideas, some things about that. But uh, for example, in uh, to produce glass, glass bottles or jars, you have two types of mold. You have a mold, which is a very, very simple one, where you put the softening material, so silica, wind, uh, with some other oxides, and usually bottles are in most cases they are colored. Uh, and you might add some other oxides uh, in order, for example, to prevent the formation of bubbles, etc. Um, and you can produce then uh, that uh, soft material, which is the black mold. We have the black mold, which has the one with no details, which uh, leads uh, the camps to produce its, the so called parison. Parison is uh, the kind of semi finishing material, so basically, like it was uh, in, uh, for steel, it was the tube or the lamina in, uh, in or the sheet. In this case, you, you might have a sort of uh, multiple shaped structure. Um, um, roughly bottle shaped, which uh, um, then you can do it make different different things, different process. You can blow, or you can you can dry, depending on the shape of what you want to produce. With bottles, you blow, which is what you do on in some cases in with polymers. So it's interesting to do. To, to know that um, is suggestive also for, com for polymers. But of course, the temperatures are different. For polymers, you don't exceed 150 or so degrees. Um, in the uh, case of glass, you can even do that 600 degrees. Um, then you blow the final shape, and in, in another, uh, after you have transferred the parison to a blow mold. The blow mold is the mold where you really blow and um, 
also the uh, type of uh, containers like jars which were pressed where you produce the paradigm by pressing in the first place then you blow and uh, um, you create the final shape with all the details uh, for example the uh, engraving or, or, or similar uh, stuff for the location to put a cap also all these details are uh, present in the blow mode so you are able to uh, shape your uh, your bottle in the ready mode and uh, right the blank mode is just is, is, is just just the general shape which resembles a, a bottle or a jar but mm, just in general perhaps you would recognize like the like the uh, semi finished view you may possibly recognize a cheese for example but this is not exactly you know, uh, what this tube is for and uh, of course there is no connection so the difference of the tubes which are required for mechanical operations like molding. So um we have the um Diffuser that I'm talking about the glass, um, and we did not forget, don't have to forget one thing which is important in the practical uh, operations, in the practical um, verification of properties of glass. Uh, and this is the fact that in practice you get normally quite dispersed values. Uh, you do mechanical tests and you have get dispersed values and uh, this wouldn't be a problem if you um, wouldn't have to design if you want to design even a bottle you design a bottle for a shape with a shape um, and uh, you, um, you you then have a number of operations for so and, and so on for example Putting the cap of your on your bottle, and you need to be uh, sure that it doesn't uh, break at that uh, at that uh, load at the load you apply. This uh, this is the quite unusual for bottles and so on. But but when you start from for, to apply uh, glass as a structure of uh, material, like in uh, um, glass panels, the windows. But also in, uh, for example, in isolators, or in uh, um, or in biomedical applications, some cases you apply uh, glass in some applications. For example, in uh, in the material which is uh, considered used in in uh, the hospital environment, where uh, we call it easy washable and um, and, in that, in, and you, you need to apply in this case some considerable loads um, then you what you deal with uh, when you test uh, glass structures uh, usually in compression what you find out in practice is that you know the probability that failure of course you want to know that at uh, sigma zero you apply to your load which is sigma zero which of course you know it is much less than uh, the maximum strength of course it is much less than this but even so and even uh, considering that um, there are you might know that there are flows uh, there are uh, cracks so like in the uh, Griffith theory the problem is uh, uh, that uh, uh, in some cases you don't see the cracks that's why there is a, a control in, in tools <laughs> like in uh, like uh, you have seen in production of uh, uh, float glass laser control but uh, um, you can have the scratches, for example, which occur during service. And in any case, uh, uh, Griffith theory is very interesting. 
for uh, small structures, especially doing uh, production, like portals and some uh, washing machine portals. Lots of washing machine break because of the failure to do portals. Uh, so it is important for this kind of large stresses, etc. But in other cases, what you want to know is the, uh, the probability without caring about cracks in some cases and without having time and possibility to investigate into cracks. Uh, you want to know the probability that it would break at that um, stress you are going to apply, which is going to be low. And so you have uh, that uh, formula that relates the probability that failure occurs to the stress, so the maximum one, so the um, and so the failure stress, the actual stress uh, you are applying, you would like to apply, and the viable models, which gives you an idea of the dispersion value. If the um, viable models is high, then the measurements are less scattered. And uh, and of course, the reverse is also, also true. What I'm saying is that, for example, you have, the, well, you, you get two types of curves, as you know, statistical distribution. You get the density function and the cumulative uh, distribution. So, in the density function, you get how many samples break per each level of stress. So, you have a resolution of the level of stress and you get how many samples break. Of course, uh, um, to do this, there is another consequence of this, that we, you, are, you are accustomed to, in steel, for example, since it is a quite isotropic material, but also it's an homogeneous, and, and it is tough. It is considerably tough, steel, after all. It might break because of a crack, but in fatigue after a long time and so on. Uh, here, uh, glass is much less tough than steel. Therefore, uh, you don't, uh, you cannot limit yourself to five samples. I test five samples, I take the average, and this, okay, this is my stress. Uh, no, in the case of glass, if you want to have a rough idea of what's happening, you get 30, 40 samples. And you get a really rough idea of what's happening because you get a distribution which might take different shapes with a low M value, uh, which means they are really very scattered. Uh, so basically, any single sample might have a different um, stress, which is uh, from the point of view of the, the sample. And it's a disaster. You are not able to put a sigma zero and say, okay, well, if I have this stress, I wouldn't have much um, accidents. Uh, you have to design the material in order to increase the M so that um, at sigma zero is the most probable value. Then there are some fortunate and some unfortunate samples, but we can be safe that if we don't push, if we, we don't go uh, beyond that, then you uh, you don't have to be. Uh, if we don't go beyond that, uh, we can be safe, reasonably safe. That in, in most cases we don't we would not have access. Then there is a cumulative distribution, of course, which gives you an, a, a more precise idea of the fact that the sigma zero, which is a, a stress, for example, the design stress, uh, for example, you, you get this amount of, um, of samples which fracture, which was more than the sequence, 60, 65 percent. So you get the uh, sigma, which is higher, and then you get 50% of the sample, which is the, the, the maximum of it, which is uh, 1 fx. So when the f sigma, the function of sigma, is 1, which means 100% of the sample stress. 
I don't care much about the stresses, where 100% of the samples are broken, but I would care of, uh, of having a safe stress at which very, a very limited amount of the samples are broken. Of course, uh, in the stress curve, this is this zero is for the two negative distribution. I, I hope that the stress uh, sigma doesn't start at zero, that I have a safe area. Like uh, you can see that for m equal to 10, you have a safe area where in reality you don't have any breakage. This is good, that means that I am safe until a certain sigma. Instead for m equal to 1, uh, basically uh, the most unfortunate samples start breaking at a stress equal to 0. Which means that I have to discard a lot of pieces and so on, and I have to basic con consequence of that. I have to redesign my piece in order to increase my m. What I would do, I don't exactly know. It depends on it depends on the case. I may consider changing the shape, change the mixture, adding some oxides, uh, uh, reducing some other oxides, uh, changing the the thickness, uh, etc changing at the temperature at which I proceed in pulling down my samples. Of course, the flow glass process is not exactly, uh, well, the temperature has always, uh, has, has always uh, some general, general size too, but uh, they might be modified by the mixture and, and by the, depending on the cooling rate, the cooling rate is another factor and the consider cooling is Slower in a slower way and so on. So there are a number of factors. But anyway, what what is the uh, observation is uh, that if n is uh, equal to one, uh, I have a problem. So um, what uh, sorry. Sorry, I, I interrupt a, a, a little bit. Interrupt a little bit because I don't know which kind of slide I have, I have shared. Um, okay. Any, anyway, we can uh, carry on and finish our um, our um, lecture on on uh, ceramics next time because I have still an old uh, still loaded an old file. I'm sorry for that. I suppose I have to, I have to, um, loaded the the, um, the good version. Um, so yeah, I try. I see if I, I can try in a, in a few minutes to well in, in a couple of minutes to because I want to complete my my lecture. I if I, I see if I am able to replace it in a, in a couple of minutes.
Okay, I carry on uh, sharing my content and we finish, I hope it's the right one. Yeah, it should be. Uh, sorry for the inconvenience, but um, it was a previous version. Anyway, um, after having uh, uh, talked about uh, glass and having uh, uh, more or less introducing the problem of uh, ceramics, we try to um, to concentrate on, uh, as you may remember, there were uh, two types of uh, ceramics in general. In general terms, there are uh, the so-called uh, commodity ceramics or the traditional ceramics, which. Uh, um, which the, the commodity ceramics the commodity ceramics are the ones which have been uh, traditionally uh, used and uh, i hope you see my uh, sharing of my presentation okay the commodity ceramics were the ones which uh, were usually used in um, also in the in history during history so basically they start from the fact that uh, we have uh, some minerals in on earth's crust so basically the two main minerals we have are um, silica and uh, alumina and so um, silicon oxide and aluminum oxide and uh, uh, so we started basically from that and um, this is an idea gives you an idea what we have on earth crust and uh, uh, therefore we have uh, aluminum, aluminum silicates uh, like feldspar uh, um, normally we have sodium and potash feldspar or hydroxyapatites. Hydroxyapatites are important as well because they constitute bones and so they are replacement for bones. They are able to be integrated into bones because one of the main applications of uh, non-traditional ceramics, so the going, going from traditional ceramic to advanced ceramic, to engineering ceramics, one of the idea is to contribute as biomaterial to, uh, to the medical studies and to uh, transform uh, processes like it for dental um, capsule and uh, for, and also for as bone replacement. Okay, you don't see the slides. So there's a Now we should shift to the slides. I suppose. Are you seeing the slide now? Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, um, and so um, again, we have some coloring agents, and uh, here this uh, diagram is. Uh, diagram uh, gives you an idea of uh, what are the three main agents into traditional ceramics, which are basically clay, feldspar, and quartz. Quartz, which is basically um, silica and 
but it is crystalline silicate, so it's not glass. Uh, then you have a uh, first star, which is an aluminum silicate, which is uh, which got, um, which has uh, different um, different oxide content, as I was saying. Then there are a number of uh, possible uses, basically. Um, some are biomedical ones, like dental porcelain. Some other are uh, electrical ones. Some others are in construction tools like plates and tiles. So, okay, um, a number of uh, indications are important in general personally with ceramics. Ceramics, we have the problem in uh, drying, which is a problem which we will have also in some cases in drying and hardening in some comp in some polymers. And we have it's a problem which we have a, a lot with cement, which we are going to discuss next time, which is going to be on next Monday because we don't have lecture on the first of May, and uh, which is called curing. Curing means uh, drying with hardening. Um, in some cases, at uh, room temperatures, in some cases, we need some temperatures. But for example, for cement, it's usually at the room temperature. Uh, you get ceramic from my mineral crushing, and of course, traditional ceramics and engineering ceramics are um, the main difference is that you con don't control the porosity in the traditional ceramics, while you are required to control the porosity in engineering ceramics. How do you control the porosity in engineering ceramics? What you can do is uh, Sintering, for example. Sintering means that you apply a pressure at some temperature and you make the uh, porosity to collapse. Uh, sinterization, it's a sintering, it's, a, it's applied into uh, ceramics, it's applied into metal. These are the types of ceramics and uh, you have different uh, um, types. Uh, with different hardness, quartz is harder than feldspar uh, than than kaolin clay. Um, kaolin clay clay is not particularly ductile. In, in other cases, you might have a clay which is workable with uh, being uh, with water. Or clay for pottery is work workable, which is not the case for kaolin. Kaolin um, clay. Uh, on the other side, the Kaolin clay is uh, uh, harder, still harder than uh, the so called ductile workable uh, clay, um, which is the one uh, which is known as terracotta, which is uh, added with iron oxide, especially for coloration. And you can see that it's usually reddish also because of the iron contribution. Um, so sintering allows you collapsing at some temperature, some considerable temperature, in some cases, temperature which is close to melting temperature. Uh, that's usually the case. You are not you are, you are not in a liquid state, but you are close to melting temperature, and the time might be considerably long in some cases. Especially in metals which have a very high melting temperature. You may remember that, for example, when lead has got a very low, or zinc has a very low melting temperature, there are some metals, in particular tungsten and tantalum, which is less usable than than, than that's a law in some cases. But in the tungsten, it has been used a lot, especially in the production of ceramics. Like tungsten carbides and in the electric, the electrical fields, what you use a lot as for um, lamp filaments. Um, and uh, you, you allow the, uh, the corrosive to collapse, and then you can do that in uh, up to very high temperatures. Uh, tungsten has got a melting temperature which is even up to 2,700 degrees. And so basically you can go up to 1,200 or even a little bit more. 
and basically uh, initially when you press all that some liquid might form at the uh, interface between the different uh, um, grains basically um, but for, Further on, you get a kind of matter transportation to close the porosity. Um, and then you have a real interconnection, so you, you create some real rear between the different grains, and so they really close the porosity. So, of course, also the density increases, the real density, not the bulk, not the bulk density, the real density increases. And you have a number of uh, uh, ceramics like uh, silicon carbide, uh, sil tungsten carbide, which is still used, for example, in, in ball pans as uh, to absorb the um, as to absorb the heat uh, and diffuse it. Because in practical terms, you, you may not even talk about the, um, what what happens is that you have a large compression force on um, dispersal, even if because of the small dimension and you apply a practice level force. So it needs to withstand uh, compression. And as it is the case, uh, for example, uh, for shear force in the case of uh, um, cutting tips, cutting tips uh, made of the uh, Tungsten, um, tungsten carbide, all of the um, silicon carbide. The, the economy of sites is like used in the, uh, the bent field. And, uh, um, and also as an electrolyte in fuel cells. But um, apart from, of course, it's a kind of a niche niche of the uh, uh, advanced ceramics, but there is also the fact that they are very expensive, very expensive materials, and therefore it's a niche of high value. Um, in some cases, uh, there has been also a kind of uh, cement cementation, which which uh, cementing is a, a process which is important for tungsten carbide, for example. Um, to um, increase its, uh, uh, the dimension of the, also of the grains, and it, it, make, it makes it um, a little bit more ductile, a little bit less brittle, and also it gives also some uh, mag magnetic properties. Of course, not at high temperature, but it uh, makes it a little bit magnetic by the addition of cobalt. Um, so it, uh, it is uh, uh, working it with cobalt, you, you, can, you can make it also more uh, workable because the problem with these ceramics is that they are not very workable uh, in normal cases. Sinterization, sintering can be done in two stages, in two steps. Two steps. The first one at higher temperature, the second one at lower temperature, for example, or the reverse. What happens with that is that you increase the mechanical properties and you reduce some phenomena. For example, hydroxyapatite, which is the material good for austere integration. You may remember that in titanium, we use titanium for as a biological, as a biomaterial, biocompatible. Biocompatible means that it doesn't produce a negative reaction in a very implanted in your body. Bioactive means that it does something. It does something so it helps reconstructing the bone. But of course, titanium does not participate in the bone. It just helps it for rebuilding. Whilst with hydroxyapatite, hydroxyapatite will be integrated into the bone and disappears into the bone in the long run which is the best option with some limitations because it has the strength that, for example, the tensile strength that titanium has. It surface fatigue uh, quite a lot, uh, also because uh, uh, cracks might extend 
Um, I'm not going to talk about particular ceramics, but uh, please be aware it's still uh, it's there because it is two hours. It's not possible to talk about everything. But cyclic uh, loading has got a considerable effect on the ceramics. And the uh, hydroxyapatite, we have the problem of transformation between uh, the two phases, the alpha and beta phase of hydroxyapatite, which might represent a problem because. Uh, might reduce uh, its, uh, its strength and increase its porosity. Um, apart from advanced ceramic, most applications are applications in uh, um, construction, for example, in, uh, about ceramic composites. We are going to talk quite a lot about ceramic composites, um, like uh, concrete ceramic composites, those composites when you have the cement and you have aggregates like sand or gravel which are inserted in the cement and they, they contribute, they, it, it's a ceramic reinforced with another ceramic, so it, it's a composite with a ceramic particle. Um, you, you, you can have, uh, uh, most uses of ceramics are like, like that, this is the mainstream. Then you have the niche of advanced ceramics which has the uh, high value. You can have this kind of composite bricks, for example, in 3D sheets and porcelain cement. Um, you can have also composite bricks because now there is a uh, requirement to include some, uh, in some cases, try to include some waste, some construction waste. Or some agricultural waste, as it is the case for peat, um, which is basically with peat as the residual of the, of the soil, which is the, is the carbon of very low value. Uh, and uh, mm, then you have uh, bricks, which uh, can be produced also at coal, uh, can be also called coal. This is an opportunity which has been investigated. This was the old way of producing bricks without having the permits. You can also produce bricks in a cold form, which is another possibility, which is uh, which is uh, uh, currently investigated because we want to reduce the impact of a number of uh, situations. We have the problem with asbestos. Asbestos is a ceramic, and is a ceramics which is uh, outlawed was outlawed a few years ago. It's a fibrous ceramic. It's not a, a particle ceramic. It's not a glass. It's not a ceramic arranged into grain. It is a thin fibrous ceramic, and it is a natural material. Um, and the problem is that it, it, it is in um, filament, and to dispose of the uh, asbestos, there, is, there are special ways of disposing of it. This is a process that allows it allow to reuse asbestos because it becomes amorphous. When asbestos is amorphous, it's not dangerous, no longer dangerous in terms of inhalation into our body. Uh, so uh, this is a process that allows you to um, reuse asbestos, which is a naturally occurring material. Plus, it is a material which is heavily in heavily present into construction and demolition waste, so it needs to be treated to be to become a to become amorphous and possibly in reuse of into some. Consider, please, please be aware that uh, introducing something some waste into cement and into asphalt, for example, is a large largely used procedure in the last few years because it is. On one side, it is a safe place to put waste because it lasts for a considerable number of years. On the other side, cement uh, has a success because, like asphalt, has a success because they cost nothing. And anything that allows them to cost even less would improve their use. They have not particular. Uh, Quality with respect to stones, with respect to bricks, but they cost money. And so that's 
for purpose of doing this kind of operation. Here we have a toxic waste, a harmful waste, in some cases even toxic, because you then can die by the effects of asbestos fibers in your body, but it can be processed and so to be made as, as amorphous and be reused, not dangerously in the cell. Uh, we have uh, large problems of uh, um, disposing of these materials because in some cases uh, you would consider, for example, that making a composite would be a, a good idea. But you can see here, for example, typical use on composite is in bathroom fittings. In bathroom fittings, you have a mixture. Uh, you have a mixture of uh, cowling clay, quartz, and feldspar. Um, because you want to keep the cooking temperature as reasonable as possible, you want, don't want to, do, to go that high as for cooking temperature because, of course, it costs more and so on. You can introduce, by, for this purpose, uh, waste glass or lead oxides and so on uh, to try to reduce the cooking temperature. The real problem now is that you are uh, gradually introducing not only other ceramics, but for example, resins, polymer resins. Um, another application, and, and I will uh, give you uh, in the last few minutes uh, some more details on this, this question of polymer resins. Uh, another question which is important is the antibacterial action, for example, the antibacterial silver which can be added to some ceramics in, for example, to be applied also to biocompatible, uh, biocompatible structures and some dental um, structures, dental implantation implants and so on. Um, because uh, silver has got not large problems with the reactions like it was the case for mercury, mercury is toxic. It was used a lot for dental healing. Um, but on, on the other side, it's able to have these antibacterial uh, actions also in other supports like uh, vapor and plastic. We are going to discuss a little bit on silver uh, action uh, also in uh, when talking about uh, polymers and biopolymers. Um, so what happens in reality? You might, uh, when, when you have bathroom fitting, you, you might have, for example, a very simple situation like this dozen in uh, stainless steel, which lasts quite a lot. Um, it, is, it has some a number of uh, Problem is not is not perceived uh, in many cases as hygienic and so on. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, what happens in most cases is that we have these uh, uh, alternatives which are made of a composite. So we have ceramic, which might be granite, for example, in the powder of granite, or we might have which is. Um, Ceramic, and we might have uh, uh, other kind of uh, uh, ceramic, which, is, which are always based on uh, clay, iron clay, and pepper, and so on. And this, of course, and and we have also the presence of acrylic or polyurethane. This is a big problem because, in the end, as a matter of fact, it is not that easy to uh, separate them at the end of life, so they end up in one piece. This is one challenge we are going to have in the next, in the next few years, because of these have, uh, have these kind of shapes, uh, which are, there are some kind of shapes which are perceived, of course, are, as more suitable and so on. In reality, what happens is that to get to these shapes with ceramic, not to be very complicated. We need to have this kind of composites, 
this kind of composite to reduce the um, the molding the time pressure and uh, or to make uh, to make some laminates um, some laminates uh, which in some cases might involve also some glues some bonded uh, structure like in this this one which is for back tabs you might have some different molding different cut structure the cut the structure is layered by progressive cutting and in the end you get a very complicated material which you are not really able to disassemble at the end of the day one idea would be to put to grind everything and to put as a powder somewhere but then you have a problem with the rest the resin might be not suitable for example for insertion of the salmon which might be an option but in some cases it might not be suitable because it might change also the properties of salmon when in contact with water so uh, sorry for the inconvenience uh, we uh, had completed our discussion about glass and basically on what we call ceramic apart from cement and concrete and of course of concrete which we are going to deal with on next monday um, at four uh, then we are going to uh, concentrate on the last part of the course on uh, wood polymers and uh, plastic based uh, polymer based composites um, so um, if you start making your mind about which kind of subject you want to treat in your educational paper, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to listen to your subject suggestions and uh, um, to try to work on this. Um, apart from apart from this, 